Council, Dr. Ebo Banaman, the University of Liberia, the acting tenor auditor, principals, or there's only one principal here now, principal of Golden Technical Education, Professor Fulolu. The Director of Development, Deans, Directors, University Chaplain, Deputy Registrar, here present, Eminent Professors, Heads of Department, IUNIS. Senior members, senior staff, junior staff, junior members, invited guests, the press, ladies, and gentlemen. Our communication activities are always we always have our congregation being heralded by activities. Prominent among such activities is the congregation lecture. Since 2006 we've had congregation lectures among the speakers from that time are Sir Daniels, Professor Kalustus Juma, Dr. Obin, and the neurosurgeon Professor Frimpong Boateng, who spoke last year on statism in Ghana. We have been very careful in the selection of speakers for the congregation lecture. And since 2006, when we started heralding our activities, our congregation of lectures, we've had very eloquent and well-informed speakers. Their lectures have been very educative. This year, we have again carefully selected a well-informed Ghanaian, a lady for that matter, to talk on that person who made a tremendous impact on Ghanaians and many Africans of his time and if we continue to make impact on us today through the legacy which he left over for us. He died well over 40 years ago. We keep remembering him for what he did 
for us. Well over 40 years after his overthrow, the structures that he put up are among the best within our educational institutions. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to chair this function and I entreat you all to join me to support the speaker to make the program a successful one. Thank you. The librarian, principal of the College of Technology Education, deans and heads of department, colleagues, faculty members, students, the former chair of the University Council, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I stand before you in deep gratitude to the University of Education Winneba for honoring me in a number of ways. I must recall that in 2004, I received recognition on two separate occasions here at the university. First, in July, I was given a University of Education Winneba Award for special contribution to the birth and development of distance education in Ghana. Secondly, in September, the special congregation marking the momentous occasion of the attainment of full university status and the 10th anniversary of the establishment of this institution, I found myself the only woman in a highly distinguished company of the first six recipients of honorary degrees from the University of Education, Winneba. On this platform for the first time as an honoree since that auspicious occasion, let me state publicly, Mr. Vice Chancellor, that as I observe with keen interest the growth and development of this institution, I remain a proud recipient of the degree of Doctor of Letters Honoris Causa conferred on me at the time. And now, this. The immense honor done me in inviting me to deliver the 14th congregation lecture. I can only say that I stand before you in full cognizance of the significance of the occasion and can only hope that I'll be able to make a fitting contribution to the discourse on education led by this university. Before I go on to talk about the rationale for the choice of theme, let me just say that uh, at some point I'm going to be sitting down because I have a bad knee, so don't worry about it. I'll, just, I'll still try and reach out to all of you. Now the rationale for the choice of theme, I thought I should begin uh, by providing the reason why I chose this theme. When I think about education, a lot of ideas fill my head. Um, that have to be explored from the theoretical and practical point of view. There are policy matters, issues of management, issues of delivery, but I hope I can convince you by the end of this submission that in spite of the burdening demand for education which threatens to stretch our resources to their very limit, and the pressure on policy makers and deliverers like you, it is necessary for all of us to consciously spare the time to generate and regenerate a coherent philosophical outlook for education in Ghana. Ladies and gentlemen, there is robust evidence that as we took our first steps into nationhood with a commitment from the seat of education, the seat of government, education, and that is African-centered national education policy was at the forefront of our minds. On the occasion of the celebration of the centenary of the birth of Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, first president of the Republic of Ghana, it seemed to me quite apposite that we should, I should invite us all to return to the period 1951 to about 1964, during which bold steps were being taken to define a suitable ideology for a socially equitable nation-building enterprise. Furthermore, on the occasion of the centenary, it was impossible, as I considered the theme, for me not to recall that this very university, and indeed these very premises, were one of the main planks of education, being the education of state and party officials in the state ideology and policies. 
Um, what were the wider implications of this broad definition of education? I hope I'll be able to share that with you as we go along. So, Vice Chancellor, we find ourselves in an increasingly globalized environment, bristling with multi and transnational entities promoting targets, strategic goals, and conventions. To what extent are these processes also ideologically based? And to what extent is our country involved in defining these ideologies if they indeed exist? Now, this is the way I'm going to proceed. First of all, I'll engage in an introspection on Dr. Kwame Nkrumah because I think we should look at his educational trajectory and what shaped his ideas between about 1920 and 1947, in the 1920s, late 1920s and 1947, when he started his political work in Ghana. Then I'll present a few of the recurring themes in Dr. Nkrumah's advocacy and policy statements on education. And having done that, I intend to provide a summary of educational policies taken in the period 51 to 64, and then look a bit at the seven-year development plan, 63 to 69, 70, and hopefully be able to bring us forward to this current age of what I call the age of global neoliberalism, beginning in the 1980s, and briefly interrogate the relevance or otherwise of raising the issue of ideology in our contemporary context. So let's go to um, Nkrumah's education. Dr. Nkrumah's early education was under difficult circumstances. He attended school in Hafasne, where his father lived. Upon completing his basic education in 1927 and having taught as an untrained teacher briefly, he entered the Government Teachers College, which was absorbed into Achibota School, from where he graduated as a teacher in 1930. It is worthy of note that he had come under the influence of James Quajiri Agri, the then assistant headmaster and only African member of staff. Agri was not merely an administrator, but a Christian missionary, an educationist, intellectual, and nationalist who propagated strong views on matters such as the need for African education to involve the heart, the head, and the hands. A view which had been championed by the African-American educationist George Washington Carver. He also famously reflected the view that like the black and white keys of the piano, there would be no progress in world affairs if the contributions of African peoples were ignored or undervalued. It is worthy of note that Kwejiragre had spent many years in the United States acquiring an impressive formal education in both the sciences and humanities and a high consciousness of the status of the African in America. And later on, Nkrumah was to take a similar trajectory. So after teaching in Almina briefly at the Catholic Junior School, Kwame Nkrumah was transferred to Axim and became the head of the Catholic school there. During this period, he prepared for and took the University of London matriculation examination, failing in mathematics and Latin. <laughs> he went back to Almina in 1932 and taught at the Catholic seminary in Emisano, where he even considered submitting himself to the Jesuit order. By the 1930s, the seed of nationalism were germinating in West Africa, and Kwame Nkrumah is known to have been aware of nationalists such as Namdi Azikwe, the editor of the African Morning Post. Now, with the assistance of relatives, Kwame Nkrumah was able to set off in 1935 for the first black university, Lincoln University in Pennsylvania, in the United States to begin an education at Odyssey, which was to last 10 years. In his autobiography, he makes the following point. My 10 years in America had been happy and eventful, but at the same time had been remarkably stressed, stressed, strenuous. Sorry. Life would have been so much easier if I could have devoted all my time to study. As things were, I was always in need of money, and hard work was the only way that I earned my living. Now, earning his living by hard work, this included peddling fish in Harlem and working in a soap factory. Under the circumstances, Nkrumah availed himself of, of a broad, rich education with a strong penchant for Pan-Africanist and Socialist thought, as well as history and philosophy. His formal degrees earned 
were as follows. From Lincoln, a BA magna cum laude in economics and sociology, 1939, a Bachelor of Theology in 1942 from the Theological Seminary at Lincoln. He then transferred to the University of Pennsylvania and Philadelphia, where he obtained an MSc degree in education, 1943, and an MA in philosophy, 1944. Unfortunately, according to the write-up for the Kwame Nkrumah at Penn Digital Exhibition, which is currently displayed at that university's archives and records center, both of Nkrumah's theses are lost. We do, however, have an inkling of the concerns from his concerns from two articles which he wrote as an undergraduate for the student journal Educational Outlook. In the first, entitled Primitive Education in West Africa, which he wrote in 1941, he is at pains to demonstrate the robustness of the education system he left behind in his home continent. He says, the education of a child is likely a process of acquiring in the first place conditioned reflexes and then the more permanent associations and systems that we call habits. The leaders of primitive West Africa for a long time consciously and unconsciously have been aware of this psychological fact. He proudly makes